In part one, we determined the key and scale of the melody we want to harmonize. We wanted to know the scale because it tells us the chords that are likely to be useful to us. We discovered that the scale is the natural minor scale rooted at G. But for this video, we are going to use relative pitch terms. We do this because it's good for our souls. But if you watch the previous Music Theory Distilled videos, you should have no trouble translating back to specific chords when you need to. From those other videos, we also learned how to harmonize a scale. So for the natural minor scale, we know that the chords are 1 minor, 2 diminished, flat 3, 4 minor, 5 minor, flat 6, and flat 7. This pile of chords will be our beginner's toolkit for harmonizing our melody. We'll display them off to the right, but understand that they are not part of the timeline of our melody. They are just over there for visual reference. General guideline number one. A chord will sound more consonant if the melody note overlaps a chord note. One way to visualize this process is to picture our melody as a little mouse trying to cross a river by jumping on logs. The logs are the notes found in the chords we choose, and they give the melody mouse a place to land as it moves along. If the mouse lands on a log, the result will sound natural to our ears. If the mouse lands somewhere without a supporting log, it will get wet, and the music will sound more unusual or challenging. As we build our progression, we will keep in mind the pile of chords we are pulling from. To keep our mouse dry, it turns out that it doesn't matter if a chord note is in the same octave as the melody note. So the chords shown here include notes reflected up and down an octave as needed. For example, the 4 minor chord uses the 4, flat 6, and 1 notes. Here we are showing the 4 and flat 6 notes in their normal positions, but we show the 1 note down in the lower octave. We do this where necessary for all of our chords, just so we can easily visualize the support that they might provide our mouse. Let's start with the very first note. For this note, there are three different chords that will provide support. Doing this in your head takes a little practice, of course, but it's not as hard as it seems at first. You can also make your own visual guide by drawing the shape of your scale and listing the harmonized chords and the notes they use. Let's just choose one of these three chords at random and declare it as the chord for this part of the melody. Let's repeat this process for the second note, and so on for the entire melody, randomly choosing chords as we go, as long as they provide support. Our mouse now gets across the river without getting wet at all, except at that natural 7 note, which we will talk about later. What does this sound like? Uh, interesting. It works, kind of, but it's awfully busy. Number two, matching every melody note with a chord will probably result in too many chord changes. As you just heard, chord changes that obediently follow every single melody note are usually not the best option. Well, it's a matter of taste, of course, and don't let anyone stop you if that's your sound, but it's not a typical way to choose chords. There is no hard rule about how often to change chords, but you can begin by doing so once or twice per measure. Let's restrict ourselves to changes at these locations. Our mouse is going to get wet now. These melody notes, for example, are no longer supported by chord notes, but they go by quickly, so any disagreement they might have with the underlying chord will be hard to notice. This progression sounds better. But it is still a little unusual sounding. Number three. Traditional chord progressions can work well. We chose chords that agreed with our melody notes, and we've produced a functional chord progression. We might be satisfied at this point, but if we want something more traditional sounding, we're going to need to draw from a vocabulary of common chord progressions. There's no magic way to familiarize yourself with these progressions. You just have to start paying attention to the chords used in music you listen to or play. It's fun, I promise. If you know some of these patterns, this chord progression can be made a little more normal sounding by changing a few chords here and there. Since we're still only pulling from the same pile of chords, we could have discovered this progression through trial and error, but knowing the vocabulary helps save time. Number four, non-traditional chord progressions can work well. Once you know the common chord progressions, it can be useful to deviate from those progressions intentionally. The ear is expecting one thing, and you play another. It keeps music interesting. As mentioned before, it's often the unexpected parts of a piece of music that we enjoy the most. Much of composition can be boiled down to manipulation of expectations. Let's get a little adventurous and change this chord to a flat 3. A little unusual, perhaps, but it's nice. 
Number five, progressions often start and or end on the one chord. Just as the tonic often acts as the home of the scale and can lend a sense of closure to the melody, the chord based off that note has a similar function. The one chord, or one minor in the case of this melody, is indeed the first and last chord in our progression. Number six, color notes matter too. Chords aren't always the simple three-note combinations we've been working with. Sometimes we add color notes to spice things up. These notes can also count as logs for our mouse to land on, or, more accurately, as smaller branches that don't provide quite as much stability as the main chord notes. The result might be more challenging to the ear, but that may be just what you're looking for. Consider this spot where the melody is on a flat three note. In our pile, we find three chords that overlap this note, the one minor chord, the flat three chord, and the flat six chord. But we can also revisit our four minor chord and add the color note necessary to make a four minor seven chord. And now our mouse has a more interesting place to land. Number seven, melodies and chords can disagree. Some mice love to swim. Some of the most beautiful moments in music happen when a melody note strays from the underlying chord. You can choose all your chords to avoid the melody note entirely, and you might love the results. When the melody note disagrees with the chord, it acts as a color note for the chord. Remember earlier when we made a more non-traditional chord choice on purpose? That chord was a flat three, and the melody goes to the two note, so the combination is a flat three major seven chord. Number eight. Chords can smooth out unusual melodic choices. Sometimes, melodies are created with little thought given to an underlying scale, or to the chords underneath. Sometimes this results in strange note choices. If a note deviates from the main scale in use, but we only used main scale notes to create our pile of chords, then none of our chords will match the deviant note. Consider this natural seven note we mentioned earlier. We look through our pile of chords, but we probably don't want to use the flat seven chord, or the flat three chord, or the five minor chord, because the note that they all include is a flat seven. We need something with a natural seven note in it, but none of the chords we have provided. To get around this issue, we will alter a chord to fit the melody note. Let's take that five minor chord and make it a five major chord, and then switch back to the one minor on the final note. That sounds better. This kind of chord mutation can work great, or it can sound crazy. Give it a try, and whatever the result, take note of the pattern to grow your vocabulary. Number nine, look for arpeggios. If you play the notes of a chord individually, instead of simultaneously, you are playing what's called an arpeggio. When vocalists warm up by going up and down the notes in a chord, they are singing arpeggios. Arpeggios are common melodic elements, and they imply a chord underneath. So sometimes an arpeggio will be a helpful clue when you're trying to find a suitable chord. For example, the U.S. National Anthem starts with an arpeggio down and back up the one chord. In our melody, you might notice an arpeggio in this section. It traces the notes of the four minor chord, so let's change our chord progression to use that chord under the arpeggio. Again, you may have preferred it with the less obvious chord choice. It's up to you. To get better at recognizing arpeggios, simply remember to play through the individual notes of chords as you study them. They will become pretty obvious. Number 10. Find chords by ear. For most people, the most functional way to choose chords is just to try out different chords underneath the melody. You inform your choices by keeping in mind the harmonization of the scale in use, and drawing on your familiarity with common patterns, but you don't really have to worry about what notes are in what chords and what note the melody is at. Always trust your ear. If it sounds good, it is good. Presumably, you are watching this video because you're not satisfied with the choices you've been making, so the other general guidelines we talked about are useful too, but when it comes down to it, for most musicians, choosing chords is not a mathematical procedure. Here is our final progression. As mentioned in part one, there are many other possible options for progressions that might sound great. How about this one?
the general guidelines presented will hopefully get you started in choosing chords for your own melodies. You will probably still have many questions. When should you use color notes with chords? What about key changes? Why do many blues songs use minor scales over chords that seem derived from major scales? What exactly are these common chord progressions I keep referring to? When you start paying attention to the music you love, many of these questions will start to answer themselves. In the meantime, feel free to suggest future video topics in the comments. On that note, welcome to all the new subscribers. I've posted a lot of non-music videos in the past, and my channel has not historically had a teaching focus, but I'm willing to give it a shot. If the energy and support continues, I'd be happy to keep trying. Thanks so much to those who supported the Music Theory Distilled series, financially and otherwise. I had actually decided not to make any more educational music videos until the recent surge of support, so it really means a lot. I hope this video was useful to you. These videos do take weeks to produce, so if you have like 50 cents or a dollar or a thousand dollars or a million dollars, there's a link down there in the hoop-de-hoop for donations. Thanks.